you have no idea how rewarding I found it. You know, the people had actually given me money for something I'd grown in my garden. It was ridiculous. I was just so excited. Um, and my husband came home from work and I said, you know what? I think I could turn this into a business. In this week's episode, I interview Sarah Whiting from Nettlewood Flowers. Sarah is a farmer florist and she shares her small business journey, how she originally had a career in management in the NHS and then on taking redundancy, she did some consultancy work, but then she started growing flowers and then she started selling those flowers and then she did a business plan She went and learned how to arrange her flowers at a floristry school in London. She also did work experience and then started working for the Real Flower Company and she set up Nettlewood Flowers. She was in Teddington at this time and she had a small garden and she grew her flowers from there and she sold not just to the public but also to florists. She continues now to sell to florists and she's moved down to East Sussex. She talks about the transition down to East Sussex and she also talks about the impact of the pandemic on her business and her plans for the future. I'm sure you'll really enjoy my conversation with Sarah. A very warm welcome, Sarah, to the My Small Business and Me podcast. Thank you for having me, Rona. I'm delighted to be here. It's so lovely to see you again. We met the last time, probably two, three years ago at Peterson Nurseries. Oh, coffee. it must be. Yes, I think it was just before we moved, actually. Yes, it was. Sussex. Yeah. Yes, it yeah. was. So, yeah. so much has happened. But before we go into that, could you start off, please, Sarah, by sharing your small business journey? Yes, certainly. Um, Well, flowers, floristry are my second career, really. I spent a long time in the NHS, well over 20 years, um, in senior management in the NHS. And after delivering a huge raft of further changes, organisational changes, um, I actually managed to make myself redundant by shutting down the (laughs) organisation that I was running at the time. On purpose, Um, I hope. (laughs) It was on purpose. It was all planned and very well managed. Um, And so I decided at that point that I would step outside of the NHS I did what a lot of other senior managers in the NHS were doing at the time, and that is set up a consultancy business. So that was my first foray into small business and worked very hard, um, taking on lots and lots of work, lots and lots of contracts. But it just it felt quite soulless um, and really wasn't doing it for me. So I said to my husband, OK, I'm going to take a bit of a break, reset and rethink. And actually, the garden's looking a bit of a mess. So I'm going to take a few months off, um, replan the garden and jig things around. Um, And I'd always been a keen gardener. It's always been a hobby, always growing flowers. Um, So I spent three months messing around in the garden, building a big greenhouse, doing all sorts of things, setting out a proper sort of cutting garden area and growing some flowers. And I thought, oh, this is great. You know, the house is full of flowers but I've got way too many. Um, So I said to the neighbour, would you like some flowers? And then all of a sudden I had the neighbours knocking on the doors here saying, oh, I hear you've got flowers spare. Um, And my husband said to me, you should charge them a little bit of money. And I said, okay, I'll do it for charity. Um, So they used to give me whatever they wanted. It went into a tin, tin for charity. Still had too many flowers. And so I put a sign up outside the gate saying fresh flowers cut flowers for sale um and i was uh, where we lived and in teddington in west london at the time we were on a school run route so we used to have lots and lots of kids being taken to school in the morning and in the afternoon it used to end up being a thing you know um the mothers etc used to come down with their kids who used to play in the garden and they used to take away a bunch of flowers um so one day I'd, I'd actually sold out of everything that I picked that was spare, came in. You have no idea how rewarding I found it. You know, the people had actually given me money for something I'd grown in my garden. It was ridiculous. I was just so excited. Um, and my husband came home from work and I said, you know what? 
I think I could turn this into a business. And he looked at me, nodded his head, and he said, where's your business plan, Sarah? Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so I did actually put together a business plan. I set about thinking about what it was that I wanted to do, um, what I could realistically produce from my back garden in Teddington, um, and you know who I wanted to sell my flowers to. Um, so yeah, so 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 that's where it all started, uh, nearly seven years ago. It's just incredible that it started in that way. It's yeah, it's. So what was the next step? Your husband was happy with your business plan. What happened next? Well, well, he didn't have <laughs> power to veto. I, <laughs> I assure you, I'd already decided this is what I wanted to do, but it did help me think. Uh, through what I wanted to achieve and set some realistic goals. Uh, and one of the things that I thought I really needed to do was to learn more about floristry um, and how to put flowers together in a way to best show them off. So I, I went off and did um, uh, a floristry course uh, in London um, that a lot of people go on and do. And, and there I met some fantastic people. Um, but I realised that actually the type of um, formal floristry um, that, that was taught there whilst being very good, really good sound basics just didn't really do it for me. And I wasn't sure it would really work with the types of things that I was growing. Um, but I was lucky enough to meet someone on that course who told me about Instagram, never having known anything about Instagram before. Um, and I went on there and found lots of people whose work really did sing to me. Um, so I duly trotted off if they were running workshops, um, trotted around the country and um, yeah, and worked with a number of different florists. And that, that was absolutely fantastic. So you traveled around the country, mm -hmm. seeing some incredible florists and they helped mm -hmm. you. Did you have any work experience or? I did. Um, so uh, I had a work experience placement organized by the, the first course that I did. Um, and I was lucky enough to uh, get a placement with the Real Flower Company in the flagship store in Chelsea that they just opened, um, which was run by an amazing woman called Catherine Rubain, Rubain, who is a fabulous florist. And of course, the lovely Rose B. Morton, who was producing all of the flowers uh, that we used in the shop. And it was just such a fantastic grounding, having to go in early in the morning, conditioning bucket loads of flowers in freezing cold temperatures, but then being given the opportunity uh, to put things together for customers using those beautiful uh, flowers that Rosebee grows was fantastic. And I learned a huge amount about the floristry industry working in that shop. And I went on, to work part time for them for uh, a couple of years, wow. uh, actually, and it was it was heartbreaking to go, but I was getting so busy with my own small business um, because I've become so attached to them um, and the work they do there. And now they've got a second shop and it's going from strength to strength. Yeah. Um, so yes, that that was a fantastic grounding and a real insight into how the floristry industry works what hard work it is being a florist. It's not just playing with pretty flowers all day long. <laughs> Very hard physical work, long hours. And, and in my opinion, I think it's a bit undervalued. But, you know, um, I think that might be changing uh, a little bit, which is great news. Well, let's certainly hope so. Let's certainly hope so, Sarah. So when you meet somebody now and they've not met you before mm. and they say, what do you do? What do you say? Um, I say I'm a flower farmer florist. Um, <laughs> okay. and, it, and it is a mouthful. Um, and it, and <laughs> it's one of the things that I constantly get asked is, are you a flower farmer or are you a florist or are you a floral designer or whatever it is? I, mean, I think basically I grow flowers, I grow flowers here and I sell them to people, but I also use those flowers in my own floristry for weddings, events, 
uh, local bouquet deliveries, that type of thing. So I think, yes, I'm a, I'm a farmer florist if there is such a thing as one. Oh, yeah, there is. Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. So please tell me you're not doing all this on your own. Um, my husband, who is now retired from his <laughs> senior management job, um, and I do it together. Um, just the two we, of you yes just the two of us I mean obviously if I've got weddings and events I do use freelancers and I've worked you know I've got a fantastic group network of people um, we all end up working for each other uh, freelance which is great uh, but all the work done on the property here the growing of the flowers etc is done by my husband and I yeah wow wow so we've kept it to a manageable size though um we you know we realize that well we're not going to expand to do any more than we currently do um what we've got under cultivation we can manage um and still enjoy and really enjoy and still experiment yeah. a bit you know growing lots of different things so there's so many questions i want to ask you sarah that i'm not quite sure where to start so i'm going to go <laughs> right back to the very beginning okay. and and your love of flowers started very young yeah. didn't it went very early years can you tell us about that yeah and again like a lot of other people it's it's family members who influence you isn't it um my nana used to do an awful lot of you know, babysitting for us when we were uh children and my mum was out working as well as my dad um and she had a beautiful garden just behind a little council terrace house in welling garden city but it just you know i remember summers there and the smell of the roses that i used to rip all the heads off and mash up into perfume and things like that we all do as a child <laughs> and um, it never worked <laughs> no it didn't and it always looked brown and stinky the next day um but just absolutely captivating and she taught me how to sow and grow flowers and I, I've told this story before but she, yeah I remember as a child she gave me these funny dusty little bulbs um, and we planted them in autumn and she said next spring there'll be beautiful flowers um, and of course being an, a very impatient child every time I went around to my nana's I'd run out to the garden no sign of it no sign of it no sign of it finally got bored didn't think anything about it went round in spring um, and she called me out into the garden and there were these crocuses the most amazing beautiful little perfect crocuses which to me in my child's mind were just like little fairies and um, it was just absolutely captivating and yeah hooked since then so it's always been a hobby gardening has always been a hobby for me wherever wow. I've been so you've always grown flowers would you say then yes yes okay I have yeah always um and yeah in, in Australia it was a little bit of a different environment but <laughs> and, and my parents weren't gardeners but I remember the first house we had in Australia which just had a dusty backyard I still put in flower beds and grew what we could a lot of Australian natives and tried lots of other things which duly got eaten fried or whatever else in such a harsh <laughs> environment <laughs> and then when water was scarce there was an issue but yeah always I've always grown oh, wow so let's talk about you setting up your company and it's mm -hmm. called Nettlewood Flowers. Yeah. Tell us about how that name came about. Oh, the desperate search for a name. It's always difficult, isn't it? And always trying to find something that no one else has. Mm. Um, and it was getting a bit silly. I really needed to get a name. And we were throwing around a number of things, but it was actually my husband um, who said, why not call it Nettlewood Flowers? Um, and the reason behind that is I used to live on Nettlewood Road in Stretton. That's where I had my first garden that was all mine, um, the first property that I bought. And it grew a lot of flowers in it, of, of course. And it was also where I met my husband. So it oh. has a sentimental attachment. But also it, it feels quite earthy and tied mm. to the ground. Um, so hence the name Nettlewood. Perfect. Perfect. So when you started out, you were living in Teddington in Southwest London. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you no longer live there, do you? Tell us about the move no. and what triggered the move. No. No. So we've been in Teddington for about 10 years. Um, and I and I was very lucky because we did have the, the house was on a quarter of an acre plot. 
um, a wall garden off the road. So I did have a reasonable amount of space to grow in. Uh, but then you know, I got an allotment as well, and that was further away, and it was starting to get difficult to manage. Um, and I couldn't produce enough in terms of flour to make it, well, to achieve what I wanted to achieve, which was you know, a, a, reason, a small income um, out of the business, because I just couldn't produce the volume. Um, so that, that was one catalyst. It also the fact that my husband was planning to take early retirement and we decided that we'd always wanted to move out to the country. We were still young enough to take on something else. We had one more house renovation left in us. Um, <laughs> and coming down this way, where it's an area that we'd visited and loved, um, but also we have family down this way as well. Um, so, so yes, that precipitated the move. And how long um, ago was that? Uh, we moved here just before Christmas in December 2019 uh, to a house that had a hole in the roof when rain oh pouring in. <laughs> <laughs> in the winter. Infest, infest right. in the winter. No heating and infested with rats. So. Oh my goodness! <laughs> it was an <laughs> an interesting first Christmas. <laughs> so you didn't so, even have a caravan outside. You've just no, in the house. no, <gasps> we were in the house. Yeah, oh, I mean okay. that. The, yeah, the, there were basic facilities here, but it was in quite a state. <laughs> so, <laughs> how did you transport you all of your cutting garden down to East Sussex? Yeah, it didn't all come. I had to be quite disciplined. Obviously, all the kit and everything else I had uh, came with me. Um, I, it, in the six months preceding leaving, I took an awful lot of cuttings uh, from precious plants. I dug up half the dahlias, left the other half for the people moving in because they were keen gardeners um, and really started from scratch. Um, the property that we moved to um, has actually got an acre and a half of garden but completely overgrown it's a very big project in itself um, as well as having uh, you know field space which is where we set up the new cutting garden so no it didn't all come with me it got left behind wow. but we planned for that and we also planned in the investment we would need to start from scratch okay. um, in terms of our business plan for that year what you hadn't planned for though was the pandemic no <laughs> um how did you cope with the move and the pandemic what was the yeah. situation for you I mean some of it was tricky well because um we had we'd realized that because we were setting up from scratch we weren't going to be generating the volume of flowers that we would ultimately like to generate so we'd factored that in we also factored in that we'd probably want to attract some new customers from the local area because I would lose some of my existing customer base from West London. Um, so we'd already planned all of that in. What we hadn't planned for, that it got very difficult to get hold of things. during the pan. Everyone went into their gardens. Um, and so there were things, I couldn't get hold of compost uh, and things like that so so that was quite tricky um I was lucky that I got a local chap in to rabbit fence off our cutting garden area because one of the other things I hadn't quite factored in was that actually we're surrounded by rabbits <laughs> and deer they're very friendly um, <laughs> they eat everything um so um we managed to get an area fenced off and we started building beds and doing everything from scratch um, but yeah, uh, not having compost, et cetera, was, was tricky early on. However, I think the flip side of the pandemic um, and the thing that has been really positive, particularly for the British flower industry, is that I think people have taken stock and thought a little bit more about where things are coming from. Um, and so it, for me, um, within the first six months, and I was mainly growing, you know, hardy annuals and things like that, plus the dahlias that I put in, demand outstripped what I could produce. Um, so whilst demand had dropped off from the florists for weddings, etc., local demand for bouquets and smaller orders, it just was crazy. 
Yeah, um, that's so good to hear for you. And yeah, and and I think I think a lot of um, flower farmers have actually had a similar experience. They've seen one group of customers replaced by another group of customers. That's slowly shifting back now, obviously, with weddings and events being back on. Um, but yeah, it, it it and I think just the profile of locally grown uh, British flowers um, has increased, and I think that's fantastic. Yeah, that's really, really good news. Talking of selling your flowers, can you share with us now who your customers are, both yeah. public and trade? Yeah. yeah. So actual flower sales, I sell wholesale to florists predominantly. Um, and again, I'm incredibly lucky because I've still got a loyal following of customers uh, from when I was in Teddington. Um, who've followed me down here and I do during the season and I do do a run up to London once a week but a lot of them also send couriers etc down to collect from London I do yeah yeah well and people yeah. send couriers down as well they do they do or they come down and collect wow um, so which is great and um and florists in the local area around here have got to know of me and they've been buying as well particularly as weddings started to pick up last year um and and that would be 90 percent of my flower sales the other 10 percent go to um, people who do diy weddings so i do supply flowers um to to those who want to do their own flowers for their weddings i sell them mixed buckets of flowers quite often i'll end up doing the bridal party flowers for them for example which is really nice to do um, so so that's that's the bulk of the flower sales the rest of the flowers i use in my own floristry um, for local bouquet deliveries which as i said really picked up and they're great because i have the flowers out in the field um, and so it works um, really well and for the weddings and events that I do myself. So when will the flower season start for you this year then? Uh, two weeks time, I'm hoping. <laughs> wow. Okay. And what's but only, only oh, the hellebores. The hellebores okay. are just starting to really pop their heads up in some of the early narcissists. Um, so, yeah, it's, it, and, and foliage this time of year. Um, I'm lucky that we've got a bit of woodland um, uh, and lots of old mature trees which I do cut from sparingly and mature shrubs as well so um, so I sell a limited amount of foliage but really the main season kicks in from the end of March um, okay. yeah and runs so it's just when? small bits um, I was still selling large numbers of chrysanthemums which I grow in a polytunnel now up to the end of November last year wow. and then and then it's the Christmas season so you've got you know, wreaths, et cetera, um, yeah. over that period, which is what everyone focuses on. So, Sarah, please, can you tell me your hellebore secret? Because <laughs> no matter what happens, honestly, when I cut them from my garden, within yeah. hours, they they're drooping. What's they your flop. secret? You have to wait until they're mature. <laughs> so they have to be ripe, not when they've still got stamens on. So they need to be okay. starting to set seed. Um, and then you need to cut them at that point um, and they're far more sturdy. I still then sear the stem ends in boiling water for 20, 30 seconds before putting them in a very long drink um, of cool water. Um, and then you'll have far more success. And some varieties seem better than others. I, I did pick some immature hellebore niger, which are out at the moment, you know, the little white Christmas yeah. Yeah. Uh, rose. And they've been sitting there quite happily for five days now with no sign of flopping which I'm quite surprised about but um, did you but yes. see them no no because they're tiny they're short oh because I had one in my in my kitchen and it lasted about three days and that when I was impressed yeah. it lasted three days so yeah. <laughs> you've got stronger flowers down in East Sussex obviously <laughs> but three days of beauty it's worth it. <laughs> yes absolutely <laughs> let's talk about your client base as in the florists yeah how have you nurtured that relationship um again i've been lucky to meet um some amazing florists and instagram again is a very powerful force so 
when I, when I was working at the Real Flower Company, I uh, happened to meet Frida Kim, who walked in the shop one day. We got chatting. Um, we, I started supplying her flowers. We built a relationship over the years that works really well, where she helps inform what I grow. We have a conversation every year and the color palettes that I grow to, et cetera. Um, but as I say, she, it, she is one of um, a number of florists who quite influential. For, I, I'll never forget trying to pinching myself one day when Rebel Rebel were walking around my garden in Teddington looking at my flowers, saying how wonderful they were. I thought, is this really happening? Um, so, so I have been very lucky. I've met a number of people, but I think the important thing is about um, nurturing those relationships, making sure that you ask people for feedback um you ask people about what they're anticipating is going to be really popular in the coming years what they want to see more of what they want to see less of um and really listen and take that on board and factor that into uh your plans really um i think it's a yeah just an incredibly important thing to do so what do you feel are going to be the big color trends for this year what are you planning on Growing. more more sludgy colors coming ah, i think still beiges more, and browns. yeah we're still in a slightly beige brown although i'm also seeing an awful lot of red but the deep, deeper reds and, and the red with the more sort of gray tones so um oh. that seemed to be very popular this year and i think will continue on but so you know, what type of flowers would that be um, well, definitely think about your dahlia colour palettes, but also the poppies uh, and things like that. Hellebores mm -hmm. as well coming in soon too. Yeah. But, um, yeah so that Talking of poppies, mm. amazing grey poppies were very popular mm. a little while ago with you. They and they're were. in print as well. Tell us more about that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, it, <laughs> I have, again, been very lucky that uh, a lot of fabulous florists have used my flowers for various shoots for magazines, et cetera. In fact, I have a little cuttings book of, not, not of me, <laughs> <laughs> or, or floral arrangements I've done, but where famous florists have used my flowers and they've ended up in magazines. So yes, Frida Kim did, uh, did a piece with my flowers that ended up in El Decoration. Um, Uncut Stems, which is a subscription service. Vicky, she's used some of my flowers in a photo shoot because she ended up in El Decor. They've been in country living, all sorts of things. Wow. Um, so, yes. So, yes, I have a scrapbook for my flowers. <laughs> so lovely. <laughs> Tell us more about the subscription service. What's that about? Oh, that's that. I, I don't run that. That's uh, Vicky okay. Baker from Uncut Stems. Again, oh, okay. another success story out of the pandemic. She started off a quite a small subscription service, um, which was a bit like a flower club where she'd send and, you know, using British flowers, uh, she'd deliver the flowers and then everyone would share on Instagram what they'd done with the flowers. Oh. And it's grown. She's got a huge waiting list. Um, and I've been supplying flowers to her for the last year. Um, and we had the conversation at the end of the year. She's now going to be too big, <laughs> um, and because uh, one of one of the one of the unique selling points of this flower club is everyone gets the same stems, so okay. they can do some things with it. But she's getting too big for me now, so she's going to go off to some other suppliers. But a fabulous success story out of the pandemic. Yeah. So you've been in business now for how many years? Seven years. Six years doing the flowers, Six so, years seven in, okay. years if you count my bit of thinking time. <laughs> okay, so if you were back at the very beginning again, mm. and there are people in your situation where they're thinking about dipping their toe into flower growing and floristry, what advice would you give them, Sarah? I've mentioned planning a lot. I do think, <laughs> I do think it's important to have a plan. Um, put a bit of thought into what it is you want to do, what's going to make your heart sing, um, what are the, some of the concrete things you want to try and achieve, even if it's dig over six beds in January and get them ready for planting and put down a few milestones. Um, and I think then it's really important just to review that as you go along. Um, 
and some things will work and some things won't work. Learn from your mistakes, adjust your plans um, and keep going. Um, and I say that like I follow it rigidly. And every year <laughs> I plan, last year I planned to plant 200 dahlias. Why I ended up with 350 ready to go in the ground is because I'm compulsive when I get on those websites and see all those beautiful new dahlia varieties and keep buying them. So <laughs> I had to revise my plans. At least it was up and rather than down. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I think... The other thing is, for me, is you should never stop learning. I, I, you know, I don't profess to know everything about growing flowers. I never will for however many years I can do it. Always go out and seek um, experiences to learn from other people. Some of it you'll take and it will work brilliantly for you. Some of it won't. Um, but don't ever close yourself down to learning opportunities. And I think that Sometimes it's very easy to think, well, I know it all, I can do it all. And actually just be open to it because you never know, you might find that trip or tip or trick that makes life an awful lot easier. Yeah. Um, and I think lastly, it's to stay true to yourself. Um, and as I said, think about what makes your heart sing and what's really important sustainability which I know is a very trendy word um, and gets misused an awful lot but actually working with nature is incredibly important to me uh, not fighting against nature um, but working with it is incredibly important to me um, we don't use any chemicals here um, and so yes I might weep when I see my daily is ravaged with aphids and I can't you know and lose half a crop but you know what do something about attracting more birds in or get out there and hose them off or whatever. Um, but that's really important to me. And, and that's one of the things that we won't compromise on. Um, and we are continually striving to reduce the use of single use plastics and all of those other things that go along with it. Um, and you still get asked to do things sometimes that actually are against that. And I've learned now to say no. I used to say yes to everything, but now I say no, because it's not, going to be the right thing for me and for us and for our business so stay true to yourself be clear about what it is that's important to you and stay true to it wow now you and your beautiful flowers caused a little bit of a sensation at the strawberry hill flower festival last year <laughs> tell us about your design and the thing that the um the part of your design, which was such a talking point, please. Oh, the little apples, the little golden apples. The dangling um, apples. <laughs> so this is, this is the thing about staying true to yourself. Um, Strawberry Hill House Flower Festival was quite late in the season um, last year. And I also had a huge number of wedding orders go out that week. So, and then I can't remember, was it great? we had a storm. Um, and so I had an awful lot of damage as well. So when it came to picking the best of what I had left for Strawberry Hill House Flower Festival, there wasn't that much around. And I got to a bit of a panic. I thought, oh my God, I'm a flower farmer, for goodness sake. If I, if, I can't, if I can't come up with decent flowers for Strawberry Hill House and something with wow factor, then, you know, goodness, what, what's that going to say about me? So I had a good look around and uh, buried in the back of the overgrown bramble and jungle that is our garden we've got um, a number of old apple trees and still hanging on <laughs> tentatively to some branches were some little slightly wizened apples so I thought well they'll do <laughs> they'll come with me to Strawberry Hill House um, so yes um, and it was a very dark room so I had to put something in there that um, would attract people's attention so that, that, that was why the apples it certainly worked. I had, when I was walking through the room, somebody stopped me and went, Rona, have you seen, have you seen the dangling apples? <laughs> Seriously? I was just like, wow. Oh, I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad they got some attention. <laughs> oh, you did. You definitely did. So could you share with us, Sarah, your why? Why does Sarah do what she does, please? 
because uh, I absolutely love it. Um, I bounce out of bed in the morning, regardless of the weather. Um, have a, a list as long as your arm, usually, of the things we're going to do that day. Um, but spending time outside, growing, cultivating is just so enormously rewarding. Um, and seeing the fruits of your labor turn into these beautiful, beautiful flowers, which then I'm lucky enough to be able to pick to use myself or to give to some amazing florists. And actually, the reward I get from seeing what other people do with my flowers is incredible. Seeing what these amazing floral designers do. And you think, blimey, I grew that. <laughs> it's ended up in old decor. And I grew it in my back garden. Yeah, um, yeah so that's enormously rewarding. Um, and you know what? The florist and flower farming community are a damn fine bunch of people. They really are lovely. And without exception, I have found nothing but encouragement and support uh, for what I'm doing along the journey. And that's that that says something about the people involved um, in this type of work and lots of free advice given, etc. And you wouldn't find that in all industries. I find the degree of collaboration incredibly healthy. My little business wouldn't have succeeded without collaboration. Uh, and um, I think that's great. It's not all about competition. Um, and, and yeah, that's something that's actually very special about the floristry and flower community, uh, I think. Mm, I totally agree. Let's, before we finish off, I, I've just got to touch on your beautiful photographs because where do you take them the, the light is incredible just in the house <laughs> in and around the house um yes all on my iphone um i'm absolutely rubbish um you are I, not uh, absolutely I, rubbish sarah you have a real eye for a beautiful photograph i do um yeah i make a new year's resolution every year to get that digital camera out and learn how to use it i've even got a session booked with it a famous photographer um which which hasn't been used yet um so no it is on my iphone it's trial and error i do look for light and think about the way the light works on the flowers and just move it around the house but you know it'll often mean balancing something on a plinth and half dozen books precariously or having to move curtains out the way or whatever else but um but yes it's all done on my iphone <laughs> So do you have a special room that you is your go-to room or? Yeah, well, at the moment, we've got a snug at the back of the house, which is north facing, but right. um, it, it used to be an old chapel. So whilst it's north facing, it's got huge, great big arch windows. So on either side, so the light that comes in at the moment, I think is rather special. It's a very dark room, but just that little bit of light, but it changes throughout the year. Um, so I do move depending on what weather's like outside um, uh, or, yeah, the season um, and mm -hmm. the, the, the quality of the light, um, if yeah. you like. Yeah. 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 So, Sarah, how have you found the best way to market your flowers? Um, I don't I don't do anything other than post them on Instagram. <laughs> um or put stories on Instagram about what's growing in the field. But what's enormously powerful for me is what other florists post on Instagram. So if some of the wonderful florists that I work with um, post something that they've made and tag me or say they've got the flowers from me, I will be inundated with requests for those flowers. In fact, <laughs> I often get contacted saying, has such and such taken all of those and are there any left for me? Um, so yeah, incredibly powerful marketing tool. Um, other people using your flowers and posting them on Instagram. Is that because you grow varieties that very few people grow, do you think? Um, well, I think I think a lot a lot of the varieties I grow, lots of people are growing. Um uh, and it, particularly some of the colour palettes that I've been growing to for a while now, more and more people um, are growing to them. Maybe, um, I think I'm just lucky because I work with some of the cutting edge florists, um, you know, so if the likes of Frida and a number of others 
put up something with a grey poppy in it. Everyone wants grey poppies. Um, yeah, so, so, so it's worked for me. Uh, mm. It's been you know, great. And so that's where the focus of my attention uh, really is. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. So plans for 2022, withstanding yeah. that whatever happens with the pandemic, what are your plans, Sarah? Pretty much more of the same. Um, so we're on top of the cutting garden now. Um, we have a clear plan about what we want to grow this year. We're experimenting a lot more with more perennials. Um, so that's quite exciting. Um, the order book is already filling up and um, I have a, a number of weddings booked and, and the florists who've worked with me for a while now um, sort of send me an email at the beginning of the year and book their weddings in, <laughs> give me their colour palettes and then um, you know, we keep that under discussion so that um, I can let them know what I've got and what's going to meet um, their needs. Um, and then the focus for us is sorting out the old formal garden that used to be here. We really have just started to scratch the surface and you, yeah, the, in amongst tons of bramble, um, good, good name, Nettlewood flowers, because the nettles are over six foot tall in the oh summer. My goodness. But in amongst are the bones of a garden that was designed, you know, there's 40 odd box shapes and all sorts of things through there, an old wisteria walkway, et cetera. So that's, we, we had another conversation this morning about which bits we're going to tackle first. So that's our project to really get on top of this year. Oh my goodness, sounds like a lot of work, but be worth it in the long run to have it a will, garden yeah. for your flowers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So no rest for you this year by the sounds of it. Oh, well, yeah. I have a very, I have a very low boredom threshold, so <laughs> I need to keep busy. <laughs> now, I think you covered your three tips already, Sarah, when I asked you about the advice that you'd give yeah. to someone, or do you have more yeah. tips that you want to no, share? No, I think, I think they're the, the three key ones. I mean, yeah, yeah. That's great, great advice. Where can people find you online, Sarah? Okay, so I have a website at www.nettlewoodflowers.co.uk or on Instagram at Nettlewood Flowers. And the season will start in earnest from in end earnest of March. from the end of March. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But if people want to sign up uh, to my newsletter, which gets sent out very infrequently, um, but I do let people know <laughs> when flowers are admin's never been my strong point. Uh, when flowers <laughs> you can't are, be good at everything. Are available? <laughs> no, no, definitely not good at admin. <laughs> So if you're a London florist and you really would yeah. like your flowers, how mm -hmm. how does that happen? What would you need to do? So I sign up to my mailing list um, and just say the start of the season, I give people an indication of what we're growing for the year and I'll send out updates on what's available. Um, but if you have big events coming up, then please do just drop me a line and I'll pencil you into the diary. Okay, so do do you say I'm going to come up a certain day of the week and then you'll visit all the florists or how does it work? Yeah, so at the moment I'm delivering into um, South London Covent Garden area once a week on a Monday currently. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, wishing you lots of luck with the growing season this year. Thank you very Let's much. I hope the weather behaves itself. The weather will be whatever it is, I think. <laughs> It was minus five here this morning, so I must go out and check things. Yeah, it was cold here too. It was mm. minus three here, so it's colder where you are. But um, mm. yeah, so good luck. And also, Thank are you running any workshops this year? Yes, we will be. So they'll be going up on the website within the next month. Yeah. What kind of workshops will they be? So from growing your own cut flowers through to inviting people to come along and pick from the cutting garden and I'll show them how to put together a bouquet um, or a bowl arrangement. So just simple things. Wow, very, very exciting. Crossing my fingers that the pandemic doesn't scupper those plans because they sound let's very, hope so. very exciting. Well, it's, it's outside, isn't it? So, you know, yes, let's, let's hopefully, hope everything hopefully. is fine. Thank you so, so much for your time today, Sarah. Oh, thank you for so having me. Oh, my pleasure. I'm just in awe of the fact that how you started just by growing flowers and putting them at the bottom of your 
garden yeah. and people find them and then yeah it was a bit crazy <laughs> yeah well you know it's incredible how from something so small has turned into something so well known and um revered in the industry for your your very well known for your flowers Sarah so oh, congratulations thank you. thank you a magazine starring flowers at that yes <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's hope our paths cross again in the future in real life again. Um, yes, so that would be lovely. Do take care and um, yeah, bye-bye for now. Thanks for having me on, Rona. You're welcome. Bye. Bye-bye. So I hope you enjoyed my interview with Sarah. It was so lovely to see her again and also to hear how her business started and how it's grown, the journey she's been going along. Yeah, I'm so thrilled that from simply initially selling her flowers for charity has led to her now moving to East Sussex and um, a much larger plot for her to grow her flowers. Such a great story. Do head over to the Nettlewood Flowers website where you can find out more about Sarah and also sign up for her mailing list and also do check out her Instagram feed, which is absolutely beautiful. In the meantime, it'd be lovely if you'd like to subscribe, like, comment, and I'll see you again next Tuesday.